Praise the Lord. I welcome you to a Tuesday Leaders Development Session tonight. And I bless the name of the Lord for keeping you alive, keeping you strong, keeping you healthy. I pray that the Lord will perfect everything concerning your person, concerning your family, concerning the ministry and the church under your care in Jesus' name. Once again, I welcome you. I'm happy that we can connect together at this time and look at something very important in the Word of God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your people. Thank you for our leaders, your servants, the pastors and the teachers and the leaders in every area of the work. Lord, we thank you for the work you are helping us to do together at this time when our people need us so seriously. We are asking, oh Lord, that this work will continue to prosper in every one of our hands in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. We pray that you open our eyes of understanding and we behold wondrous things, important things out of your word tonight in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. We're looking at Psalm 11 and verse 3. Psalm 11 and verse 3. It says, please open your Bible. I know you know this verse already, but open your Bible, please. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Think about that. Here the Spirit of the Lord is leading the psalmist to say and to ask us, what can the righteous do? As we look at the children of Israel, we see that there were times that they needed to think about their foundation. Number one, the foundation of their temple. And if the foundation of their temple be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? How will the righteous come and worship before the Lord if the foundations of the temple were destroyed? If the foundation of their city, you see they had cities, and then they had walls around the city, and those walls had foundations. Foundation. And you are asking, uh, if the foundations of those cities were destroyed, what will the righteous do? The righteous will be insecure because the enemies can come in since the foundations are destroyed and then take over the city. As a nation, Israel had foundations, the foundation of truth, the foundation of the word of God, and the foundation of the doctrine that distilled from heaven that the Almighty God had given them through the lawgiver Moses. And you see, if the foundations of their teaching, of their truth, if the foundations were destroyed, what can the righteous do? In fact, you know, there was a time that Moses went to the mountaintop and he went to collect from the end of the Lord the two tablets of, uh, of the Lord. And before he came back, the foundation of worship and the foundation of righteousness and the foundation of truth had been destroyed. And if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? You know, in their land, they also had justice, and they ought to have justice. And in a land, in a nation, when the righteous rulers, when they ruled well, and they had foundation of the constitution of the word of God in their nation, if the foundations of justice were destroyed, what will the righteous do? You can think about our nation here. And you can think about your nation there. You can think about any country of the world. If the foundations of justice, if that is destroyed and the legal institution does not have any foundation again, if the constitutions of the countries were destroyed, what will the righteous do? You think about that, there will be security. There'll be injustice and there'll be oppression and everybody will be running elter skelter in the day. There's no security. In the night, there's no security. What I'm saying is the foundation is very important and the psalmist recognized that and he said, if the foundations were destroyed, what can the righteous do? Let's come back home to our ministry to the church. And Jesus said, upon this rock, I build my church. I remember the words of Jesus. He said, anyone hearing these words of mine, and he obeys, he hears, 
He believes, he obeys, and he acts according to the word. He will be like the man that built his life, his Christian faith, upon the foundation. And the storm will come and beat vehemently upon that house. It will stand. But you know, he says, if anyone hears and he does not do it, then it's like a person that builds his house, his spiritual house, and his house of worship, and his house of ministry, he builds that without a foundation. Foundation destroyed, what can the righteous do? You want to think about the foundation of our faith. Our faith, the faith of our fathers, the faith delivered unto us from the saints. If the foundations of faith were destroyed, what can the righteous do? You think about the family. And if the foundations of the family were destroyed, what will the righteous do? You know something important in our ministry? Something important in the work he has given us to do. And what God is going to find out on the final day is our faithfulness. And you'll say, good and faithful servant, you have been faithful in a few things. Be a ruler over ten cities, over five cities. If the foundation of faithfulness be destroyed, what can the righteous do? That is, instead of being faithful and instead of being righteous, the foundation is gone. And we're just laboring and working and serving and we're active. If the foundation of faith, if the foundation of faithfulness be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Have you noticed uh, families nowadays? You know, the way people get married, they don't refer to the word of God again. And the way they run the family, husband and wife and parents and children, many people don't refer to the Bible again. It's just like the foundation of the families have been destroyed. And if the foundations be destroyed, the foundations of the family, if that be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And you understand, it says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. If that foundation, the foundation of righteousness, the foundation of holiness, if the foundation of holiness were destroyed, I was still ministering, I was still preaching, I was still running up and down, I was doing service here, we're doing service there, but the foundation of holiness has been destroyed. What can the righteous do? That's what the Lord is calling us to today. And the Lord is saying, we need to think about the foundation. Preserve that foundation. Conserve that foundation. And reinforce that foundation so that we know that the foundation is there. And we're serving. And we're ministering. And we're doing the work of God on the basis that the foundation is still kept. I want you to think about your calling and my calling. What has God called you for? If the foundation of your calling be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Think about the commission, the commission the Lord has placed in our hands, and if the foundations of the calling and the commission, if they were destroyed, what can the righteous do? Think about the ministry, the ministry we have, and the ministry the Lord has committed into our hands. The ministry of the pastor, and the ministry of the teacher, and the ministry of the evangelist, and the ministry of the supervisors who are watching over the flock of God. If the foundation of the ministry, if the foundation of our service, if the foundations of the service of the ministry be destroyed, what can the righteous do? That's what the Lord is calling us to today. And when you think about people in the Bible, and as they looked at the foundation and they saw wait a minute the foundations have been destroyed and the foundations have been eroded they did something what can the righteous do a righteous man like Moses he came back from the mountain top and he saw that while Aaron was with the people the foundation had been destroyed they came out of the land of Egypt and they were coming out of idolatry. They were coming out of everything, all the pollutions of the land of Egypt. But now, before he came back, that foundation of righteousness and that foundation of worship and that foundation of truthfulness had been destroyed. And what can the righteous do? The righteous has to do something. And Moses did something 
to bring back the foundation and to bring back the minds of the people unto the Lord. You remember the time of Elijah, Ahab and Jezebel and then Elijah, the foundation had been totally destroyed. Baal worship had taken over the whole land and a man like Elijah, that's the righteous, a man like Elijah, a prophet of fire, he came and he said, are you standing between two opinions? If God be God, serve him. If Baal, serve him. And he called the people together. You know the story. And he prayed until the fire of God came down. And eventually he rebuilt, he repaired the foundation. We have to do something. These are days, these last days, as we're expecting the coming of the Lord, when the foundation of righteousness, the foundation of truth, the foundation of doctrine, and the foundation of truthfulness is being destroyed, and something must be done. Do you remember Ezra? Ezra came to the land, and when they came back from captivity, all the people, they were here and there, those who are going to marry strange wives and marry strange wives. And those who did whatever they did and here, Ezra came back. The righteous can do something. He did something so that the foundation will be rebuilt again, will be restored again, and will be repaired. You remember Nehemiah. Nehemiah came and he went around, he investigated. And then he interceded, he prayed, he said, what are we going to do? Look at the situation of the children of Israel. The gates are born to a fire and the whole city is down and there's no proper worship. He looked at, um, you know, their city. He looked at their temple. He looked at their lifestyle. The foundations had been destroyed. And if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If you know the story of Nehemiah, he did something. That's why the Lord is calling you today and he's calling me today and he's saying we must do something. God called Jeremiah and the Lord said, Jeremiah, you have a calling. Don't say I'm a child. Don't say I cannot do this. I've raised you up. In fact, before you were born, I set you apart. I sanctified you. And it is so that you will pull down so that you will throw down, so that you will root out, and then you will build. When Jeremiah came, the foundations had been destroyed. And now, as a righteous prophet, he had to do something. Paul, the apostle in the New Testament, and when he came, all those apostles, they were with the law of Moses, Christ, and the law, Christ, and circumcision. And then Paul, the apostle, came and he said, this is the new covenant and the foundations of the new covenant were being eroded and Paul the apostle rose up single-handedly with all the team that he raised up around him and he did something. That's why the question is coming to you today and coming to me today. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The topic tonight is preserving the foundation of righteousness for a rewardable ministry. If our ministry is going to be rewarded, if our commitment is going to be rewarded, if our service is going to be rewarded, we must preserve the foundation of righteousness, the foundation of righteous worship, the foundation of righteous doctrine and the foundation of redemptive teaching. We must preserve the totality of the word of God preserving the foundation of righteousness for a rewardable ministry. There are three points we're going to consider. Number one, our watchfulness in retaining the divinely revealed foundation. Not just any foundation. Not to pick up something and then build a foundation, religious foundation, ecumenical foundation. The divinely revealed foundation, what God has revealed, he has revealed in the word of God. And Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. That revelation and that totality, entirety of the revealed word of God, for us to preserve that and for us to watch over that and make sure that we retain the divinely revealed foundation. That's what the Lord is calling us to point number one our watchfulness in retaining the divinely revealed foundation. Point number two, the work of the righteous. We must do something. We have a work to do. 
We have a service to render. And we have an assignment that we cannot dodge. And we must put our shoulder under the load and work the work of the righteous. What kind of work? Repairing, destroying, ruined foundations. If you look at Christianity in our country, if you look at Christianity in your country, if you look at Christianity in the continent, you will find out something that the foundation of doctrine, the foundation of redemption, the foundation of salvation, real salvation, heaven sent salvation, and the foundation of sanctification and holy living, that foundation has been ruined. That foundation has been destroyed. And now we come to the work of repairing. And the Lord has called you. The Lord has called me. And the Lord has called us that will be committed to the work of the righteous. That is the work of repairing destroyed, ruined foundations. Point number three is the willingness to reinforce. The willingness to reinforce and defend the restored foundation. When the foundation of a building, when it's uh, not as strong as it ought to be, we are put, uh, you know, the building, the walls and the pillars and everything uh, in the building. But now we test the foundation and we see that the foundation is in a way defective. What are we going to do? We reinforce that foundation so that the foundation of that building will be solid and the foundation will be able to take all that you put on it. We need people today. We need preachers today. We need pastors today. And we need teachers and leaders and those who have the strength and those who have the energy and those who have the spirit, those who have the conviction and those who say the spirit of the comp of compromisers is not in them. And the spirit of those who will let down and just let go like that, whatever comes and goes, those people, they do not have the spirit of the reinforcer, the person that will come and and say, it is time. I must rise up. If no other person does it, I must rise up. And I'm willing to reinforce and to defend the restored foundation. The willingness, a willingness to restore and to reinforce and defend the restored foundation. Three things. And number one, we're looking at our watchfulness in retaining the divinely revealed foundation. This is our watchfulness in retaining the divinely revealed foundation. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the comprehension of the righteous foundation. The righteous foundation. That is the foundation of righteousness. We need to comprehend that. We need to understand that. What's the foundation of our salvation? That's our savior. What's the foundation of our sanctification? That's a sanctifier. What's the foundation of our having peace with God? That's Christ, our peace. What's the foundation of our redemption? That's redeemer himself. And we need to understand and we need to comprehend that righteous foundation. Look at Ephesians chapter, Ephesians chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 12. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, that at that time ye were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. In verse 13, it says in verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, now in Christ Jesus, Jesus is that foundation and is the righteous foundation. It's the one giving to us to bring God's out of the wilderness of sin and to bring us to the light of the gospel of redemption and salvation. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes far off are made near by the blood of Christ. Look at verse 14, very important. For he is our peace. He is our peace. You understand? We need to defend that foundation. The foundation of our peace. How can we have peace with God? Through Jesus Christ. How can we have peace through justification? Through Jesus Christ. How can we have peace in our heart? Through Jesus Christ. For he is our peace. No other person is our peace. You know, 
We have studied in uh, Mark chapter 13 uh, when the Antichrist will come and the Antichrist will project himself, present himself as if he's going to have a peaceful covenant with the people and he's going to claim is their peace. And there are people that profess to be working for God and they're actually working for the Antichrist and they're projecting themselves as the people that will bring peace. They're not reckoning with Christ. They're not reckoning with our Savior. They're not reckoning with a Josephia and they're not reckoning with the priests of peace. And they're saying they can bring all this together, bring that together and they'll be the people Peace, the foundation of a peace is being eroded and the foundation of redemption is being eroded but now it says for he is a peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us in verse 15 it says having abolished in his flesh the enmity enmity between God and man Jesus Christ as the mediator, he came between the holy God and the sinful man and he joined us together. He reconciled us unto God. He abolished in his flesh the enmity. Even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man so making peace. That's Christ our Savior. That's Christ, our Redeemer. That's Christ, Christ the one that came to reconcile us with God. He's the one that came to make peace. All these fundamental things, that's the foundation. We need to reestablish that. We need to preach that all over again. And we need to reaffirm that in the minds of our people. There is just one way for anyone to have peace with God. And it is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Come to verse 20 of that, um, of that Ephesians chapter 2. It says, and we're built upon the foundation of the apostles and the foundation of the prophets look at this Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone is the very foundation that's why we're told in Acts of the Apostle chapter 4 Acts chapter 4 reading from verse 11 this is a stone which was set at naught of you builders which is become the hedge of the corner in verse 12 look at this verse 12 neither is there salvation in any other there's no other man there's no other redeemer there's no other savior there's no other religious personality there's no other religious system and there's no religious denomination that can bring salvation and peace with God to anyone. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven. There is none other name under heaven. Given among men whereby we must be saved. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 10. It says, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, building on the foundation. I have laid the foundation. I have laid the foundation and another builders thereon. But let every man take heed how he builders thereupon. While you are building, don't destroy the foundation. The foundation had been laid in the word of God by all those prophets of God in the Old Testament, and by all the apostles and the prophets, and Paul in particular, the apostle to the Gentiles, as a wise master builder, he laid the foundation. And now we're building on. Let's make sure you are a pastor, you are an overseer, whoever you are, let's make sure that we are not contributing to destroying the foundation. Let the foundation remain intact. It's the righteous foundation. And it's the only way our people can be saved. It's the only way our people can be prepared for heaven. So when Christ will come, look at verse 11. says very clearly, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Don't let any personality replace uh, Christ 
with himself and say, I'm here and this other thing is there and this other thing is there. You can look into this, you can look at this and you can have this and this is what will be the source of your salvation and the source of your supply and the source of your blessing or the foundation. Can no man lay than that which is already laid, that is Jesus Christ. And then in verse 12, it says in verse 12, Now, if any man built upon this foundation, make sure that the foundation is not ruined, is not destroyed, the foundation is not scattered. Keep that foundation and then build on that foundation something valuable, something like a treasure, like gold, like silver, like precious stone. Other people may build wood, hay, and stubble. The judgment day will reveal what they have done. Look at another thing here, the completeness of this revealed foundation. The completeness of his revealed foundation. What's the revealed foundation? In Matthew chapter 28, reading from verse 18. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That's the foundation of all our power. Jesus Christ. That's the foundation of all our strength. Jesus Christ. That's the foundation of all our authority. Jesus Christ. If anyone depends on any other power, occultic power, satanic power, political power, witchcraft power, that the pass of darkness because you know he wants to do the work of God and now he goes for another power he has destroyed the foundation and we need to know that Jesus is enough and Jesus is sufficient and Jesus with his revelation with the word he has given to us that is a complete revelation and we need to keep that we need to watch over that in verse 19 it says it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father. We can't change that foundation. And of the Son, we can't change that foundation. And of the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, it says, Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. All things whatsoever I have commanded you. We have to read the gospel to know. All things that Christ has commanded. Matthew, we have to read through. Mark, we have to read through. Luke, we have to read through. John, we have to read through. And then he said, I'll send the Holy Ghost. He will guide you to all truth. And we have to read what the Holy Ghost has revealed in the Acts, what the Holy Ghost has revealed in the epistles. And Jesus said in Revelation, I send my angels to reveal all these things to you. We have to know what Christ has revealed. All the Gospels, Acts of the Apostles, the epistles and revelation. We need to know everything, the completeness of his revealed foundation. That's why he says teaching them, teaching them. We're not teaching stories. We're not teaching fables. We're not teaching philosophy. We're not teaching ideas of men. We bring back the word of God. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. All that Jesus Christ had taught. And he preached, sanctify them. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We need to teach that. And ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in all Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. We need to teach everything Christ has revealed in his complete foundation. And it says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always on the basis that we came to that foundation. On the basis we came to the revelation of the word of Christ. On that basis, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. What is this, even to the end of the world? That means that foundation should not be tampered with, that the foundation should not be destroyed, that foundation should not be blown off, that foundation should not be replaced by any other ideology, 
even until the end of the world. And everybody said, Amen. Uh, look at um, Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 1. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, it's talking about the foundation, the revealed foundation. And it says, therefore, given the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. It says, make sure the foundation is laid, make sure the foundation is secured, make sure the foundation is preserved, Make sure the foundation is intact and after you're sure that the foundation is intact and nothing you know, is eroding to that uh, foundation. Now you can go on onto perfection. It says not laying again the foundation of, here is the foundation, the foundation of repentance from dead works. He calls us to repentance. He calls sinners to repentance. He says that is part of the foundation. And he says the foundation of faith toward God. That is part of the foundation. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, he talks about or of the doctrine of baptisms. Water baptism, Holy Ghost baptism, plural. He says that's part of the foundation and of the laying on of hands. You lay hands on people so that they can be healed. You lay hands on people and send them forth into the ministry after considering the qualification of those who are called, of those who are commissioned. It says that foundation we must not erode. And then it says of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. The people that they cannot talk about hellfire anymore, about judgment anymore, and they cannot talk about the great white throne judgment. Why? Because they have destroyed the foundation. All they are running after are just things that are superficial, not based on the foundation of the word of God. The Lord wants us to build on that foundation and not to destroy and not to ruin the foundation of the word of God. Revelation chapter 22. In Revelation chapter 22, it tells us from verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. In all the churches, I'm the root, I'm the offspring of David. And the bride and morning star. Look at verse 17. And it says in verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is the thirst come. Look at this. And whosoever will, whosoever will, the people that will say that God has selected some people for salvation and they don't accept, they don't teach, they don't believe that salvation is for everyone who will come repent and believe on the lord jesus said and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely and now he tells us something important in verse 18 in verse 18 for i testify here is christ here is jesus here is the very foundation here is the one that has revealed to us the total foundation on which we need to build it says for i testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book if any man if any man you know these are days when people exalt the title of a man over the words of god People have deviated from the word of God. The people in general, worshippers in general, they will say, our general superintendent said this. Is it confirmed in the word of God? Our general overseer said this. Is it confirmed in the word of God? Our leader, prophet, so and so said this. Is it confirmed in the word of God? The exalt and the respect a man, a leader, an overseer, a superintendent, whoever, they exalt them above the word of God. But it says, if any man, whatever his name, if any man, whatever his title, if any man, whatever his position, if any man, whatever his authority in the nation, in the continent, or in the religious world, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book, look at verse 19, in verse 19, and if any man 
shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy. God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. I want you to notice what that verse is saying. It says, if any man of a great title, any man of a great power, any man who is very popular, any man that whatever he says, people just take hook, line, and sinker, and they forget the word of God. They're not going to even refer to the word of God since if so and so has said it, if such and such has said it, final. They're not going to make any reference to the word of God, and yet, by whichever message, they are taken away from the word of God and the minds of the people and the minds of those who listen to them no more on the word of God, no more on sound doctrine, no more on Christ, and no more on the foundation that Christ has given to us. Well, if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God, almighty God, there is no man that can change the word of God and change the mind of God and say, God, well, it's me and I have this title and the people of the world have given me this authority. Therefore, I take this away. We don't accept that anymore. I take that away. We don't accept that anymore. God shall take away his part out of the book of life. Number one. Number two, out of the holy city. Number three, and from the blessings, eternal blessings that are written in this book. And then he tells us in verse 20, in verse 20, it says, He will testify this thing, say, surely I come quickly. It's the Lord that testifies this. It's the Lord that affirms this. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Verse 21, if you abide in the watch, if you stay in the watch, if you preserve the foundation, if you conserve the foundation, if you are watching over the foundation, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Now we look at our commitment to its redemptive foundation. The foundation we're talking about is not just an historic foundation. It's not just a religious foundation. It's a foundation that is redemptive, a foundation that redeems us today, and preserve the redemption of God in our lives, and also that foundation will preserve us unto the final redemption. We're coming to our commitment to his redemptive foundation. In Luke chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 46. Luke chapter 6, in verse 46, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? The Lord can say that to you, you're a preacher, you're a pastor, you're a leader, you're a teacher of the word of God. Why don't you teach the word of God? Why don't you do the things which are said? Why do you call him Lord, Lord, and he's not the Lord of your life? And he's not the Lord of your character. He's not the Lord of your ministry. And it's not the Lord you are faithful to. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Look at verse 47. In verse 47, whosoever cometh to me, and heareth my sins, and doeth them, and doeth them. There are people that talk about grace, grace, grace. Their grace doesn't do the word of God. Their grace does not obey the word of God. Grace, grace, grace. Their grace covers all iniquity, all transgression, all disobedience. And the Lord is saying, He's not giving any grace like that to just scatter the word of God and be disobedient to the word of God whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings, and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. In verse 48, it says, It's like a man which built a house, and dig deep, and laid the foundation on a rock. And laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house, and could not shake it. For it was founded upon a rock. 
But look at others that just build and build and build and there's no foundation. Look at verse 49. The foundation is destroyed. They don't repair anything. You know, you're a pastor and you are over the church. And while you are preaching and ministering, you know, you don't look at the foundation. I want to remind you, even let me bring this example illustration from the world. A new governor comes in the stage. And when that new governor comes, he's taking over from another governor. And uh, the other governor, former governor is gone. He is now there. He looks at all the projects. He looks at all the things that have been given out. He readjusts. He wants to make sure that he's leading the people now on a strong foundation. And he wants to make sure that whatever is collapsing and whatever is not all right, he repairs everything, he restores everything. And he wants to go in the direction of Haviena. He work and he governs that is steady, that is solid upon a strong foundation. The same thing you are going to do when people come to the church what foundation are they coming with? What's their background? Do they have the foundation of being born again, of the real word of God, of total redemption? You check up and then you look at the local church. Do they keep to the foundation? If you're a leader, you're like a governor and you need to look at all that foundation and make sure that we are established on the foundation that is going to take the people to heaven. That's why he said, but he that heareth and doeth them not, he hears the word of God, on Tuesday like this, he hears the word of God as we're developing the leaders and training the leaders. He just hears and he doeth it not. He comes on Sunday, he hears and doeth it not. He comes on Monday, he hears and doeth it not. He comes on any day of meeting and it's like he didn't come. He came, but even wrote knows, but he's not going to walk on them. He's not going to look at the various areas of ministry and make sure that the foundation is still well secured. Well, Jesus said, a person like that he heareth and doeth not is like a man without a foundation built an house upon the earth. He built a house upon the earth, no foundation, against which the stream did beat vehemently. And immediately it fell, and the ruin and the collapse of that house was great. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. We're looking at chapter 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Whatever people say, whatever people do, however people minister, whatever they prophesy, whatever lies they tell, and whatever frivolities they might manifest, whatever false doctrine, false idea they bring into the ministry, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having their seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. He knows those who are faithful. He knows those who are building on the foundation, on the solid foundation. He knows those who are repairing the destroyed foundation. Those who are restoring the displaced foundation. He knows his son. The Lord knows them that are his. And let everyone, you call on the name of the Lord, let everyone you minister and you say you are saved by the Lord and by the Holy Ghost. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. We're coming to point number two now. The work of the righteous repairing destroyed ruined foundation. The work of the righteous repairing destroyed, ruined foundation. We're coming back again to Psalm 11, verse 3. It says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, it's not talking as if, what can I do? The foundation is destroyed already. I come to this church. I come to this assembly. I come to minister here. As I look at the foundation, the foundation is destroyed. 
And what can the righteous do? And then we throw up our hands and say, we're helpless. We can do nothing. Can I bring you back? Uh, permit me, please, to bring you back to the history of our nation over here religiously. You know, in the 1960s, we had the Civil War. And eventually, people scattered here and there. Insecurity and crime and everything rose up. And the churches, one, they didn't have a, a place to stand and how to live. And eventually, the Lord raised us up before 1973. No foundation. You're talking of salvation. You're talking of faith. You're talking of healing. You're talking of holiness without which no man shall say the Lord. You're talking of reading the Bible. You're talking of interpreting the Bible. You're talking of applying the word of God in the lives of people. The foundations were destroyed. You're talking about marriage. You're talking about one man, one wife. You're talking about various offices. You go there, we can't find your file. We can't find this or that. You're talking about righteousness, probity, and faithfulness in the offices. Things were down. The foundations were destroyed. And then when God raised some of us up, and then deeper Christian life ministry started, the Bible study, we didn't say, well, the foundations are destroyed. What can the righteous do? And then we go into a corner. I'm righteous. I just hold on to myself. No, we went out and we fought the good fight of faith, contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. That's what the Lord is expecting that a ruler comes now, a righteous ruler, and he says the foundations are destroyed and I must do something because the Lord has raised me up. A repairer comes and he says, God has raised me up. I'm going to be a repairer. A restorer comes and he says, God has raised me up. I must be a restorer. A reformer comes. When Martin Luther came into the scene, look at the foundation. The foundation of justification by faith, all that had been destroyed. Martin Luther did not say, well, I'm just a lone ranger. I'm just a lonely person. What can I do? And everybody followed, you know, the Catholic Church. But, you know, Martin Luther rose up and he said, the righteous must do something. And so... You today, the Lord has called you like he called me before uh, 1973 and then deeper life came. You know, you have the platform on which to stand. You have the foundation on which to stand. And you can go everywhere now evangelizing and preaching the word of God and re-emphasizing you know, the word of holiness and the word of righteousness. Let a righteous man rise up. Let a righteous woman rise up. As you look at history, you know, if the righteous does not rise up, if a repairer does not rise up, if a restorer does not rise up, if a revivalist does not rise up, if a reformer does not rise up, everything will go down the drain. Apart from even the Christian faith, do you remember in America? When the blacks were downtrodden, when they had no voice, they had no place, and when they could, you could not even go to the same school with the whites, and then somebody rose up and said something must happen. He rose up, he gave that foundation that was destroyed. It's uh, Martin Luther King uh, Jr., and he went everywhere, and people followed after him until everything was turned around. Until later now, a few years ago, a black American now became a president. It takes somebody that will rise up. It takes somebody that is bold. It takes somebody that has backbone. It takes somebody that says the foundation is ruined. The foundation is destroyed. The foundation is scattered. And I will be the man. I will be the woman. I will rise up. I will do something. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, what can the righteous do? What can the righteous do? Number two, what will repairers do? When the foundation is destroyed, 
when the foundation is ruined? Can I have somebody there that has backbone? Can I have somebody there that has conviction? Can I have somebody there that says, I don't care about anything, the praise of men. I don't care about the exaltation of man. Like John Wesley that said, give me 100 men that fear nothing but sin, hate nothing but sin. And we, myself, and the hundred people can turn the world around. And he said, the world is my mission field. And here I stand, a person like that, that will stand. I'm looking for somebody today who will say, we know how the foundations are now in our country, in your country, in our continent, Africa, and beyond Africa, the foundation of truth and the foundation of truthfulness and the the foundation of righteousness, the foundation has been destroyed and ruined. I'm going to rise up as a righteous man, as a repairer, as a restorer, as a reformer, and I will do something. I pray you'll do something in Jesus' name. What can the righteous do? We're looking at Job chapter 17. We're looking at verse 9. Job chapter 17, I'm reading here from verse 9. It says, the righteous also shall hold on his way. The righteous also shall hold on his way. When the foundations are destroyed, and when people don't, they don't know anymore, which one is the truth? And which one is the way? What will the righteous do? Number one, the righteous will hold on his way. And he that has clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. You know, if you don't hold on to righteousness, you don't hold on to holiness, and you don't hold on to purity of heart and life, how can you say you're going to repair anything? Are you going to restore anything? Number one, the righteous must hold on on his way. It tells us in um, Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah chapter 51, I'm reading from verse 1. In Isaiah chapter 51, reading from verse 1, he's saying, Hacking unto me, ye that follow after righteousness. You hold on to righteousness, you believe in righteousness, you live in righteousness. And you know that the foundation in our country and the foundation of religion and the foundation of evangelism and the foundation of the truth and the foundation of sound doctrine is being destroyed. You follow after righteousness. Ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock whence ye were hewn and the hole of the pit whence ye were digged up. Look at verse 2 now, very important. Look unto Abraham, your father. And unto Sarah that bear you, for I called him alone. I called him alone. I called him alone. You know, if you are the righteous one, a man, a woman, a youth, an elderly person, and you say, I'm going to stand as a righteous one. And in these days of the foundations being destroyed, I will do something. You need to underline that word in verse 2 of Isaiah 51, alone, alone. I called him alone. I'm going to refer back again to 1973, when we started Deeper Christian Life Ministry. I had to stand alone. The church I was attending didn't agree with me, didn't understand what I was doing. Persecution came, friends left, friends forsook. My name was like a household name everywhere. And in all the various churches, they'll make announcements and mention my name and say that man, holiness, holiness, holiness. And they make jest and they ridicule. Those who met me on the way and they said, are you so and so? And I said, yes. Ah, so you are so and so that is doing this and you're scattering the churches. I said, I'm not scattering the churches. It's the people that are not obeying the truth that are scattering their own churches. I stood alone. The Lord is calling you now. And the Lord is calling every one of us now. If you have conviction, the righteous to do something you know, must be willing to stand alone and not mind the slander and not mind the uh, persecution and not mind the insult and not mind the assault of anyone. I, I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. 
I pray God will make you like that in Jesus' name. Look at Isaiah chapter 62. Isaiah chapter 62, and I'm reading from verse 6. Isaiah chapter 62, we're looking at verse 6. I've set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace, day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. You know, what will the righteous do? You speak out. What of the righteous do? You will stand firm uncompromisingly and you speak against error. You speak against false doctrine. You speak against hypocrisy and you speak against falsehood and you speak against anything, anyone that is not standing on the word of God that is destroying the foundation. You're not going to befriend them. You're not going to stay along with them and you're not going to compromise with them. You will not keep silent. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, and give him no rest as an intercessor, as a preacher. Give him no rest as a person that is taking the condition of our land, taking it to the Lord in prayer, the condition of the church, of the church at large, taking it to the Lord in prayer, and give him no rest till he establish, until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. What will the righteous do? That's what the righteous will do. Are you righteous? Are you born again? Are you sanctified? Are you holy? And do you love holiness above title, above anything? Then do something, do something so that the foundation that is being destroyed will be raised up again. Question number two, what will the repairers do? When the foundation is destroyed, you just say foundation is destroyed. I'm preaching, just keep on preaching. I'm singing, just keep on singing. I'm ushering, just keep on ushering. The foundation is destroyed. I'm ministering, just keep on ministering. The foundation is destroyed. I am laboring, just keep on laboring. You must stop and do something. If we keep on just doing all this and the foundation is not repaired and the foundation is ruined and destroyed, What's going to happen? We'll labor in vain. And so you rise up as a repairer. Look at Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. And I'm reading from verse 12. In Isaiah chapter 58, reading from verse 12, it says, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. That's a promise like, uh, I can claim that promise. The Lord raised me up. And after the Lord raised me up, I started preaching. And then we had the Palai Bible Church. And now we have pastors that the Lord has given us. We have leaders, men, women, young people, boys, girls, and even children, church workers, campus workers. And these are the people that the Lord has given to me and given to us. And he says, and they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. Thou shalt raise up the foundation of many generations that now all the people that are following, all the people that say, well, we are raised up, we're developed by you as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, as the people that will take the touch of truth and the word of truth and take it to everywhere. You are to build the old waste places and you are to raise up the foundations of many generations and thou shall be called, look at this, the repairer of the breach and the restorer of palms to dwell in, the repairer and the restorer. Well, if that is going to take place, look at verse 1 of that same chapter 58 of Isaiah. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Don't uh, speak under your breath. Don't speak as if you are afraid. You don't want uh, false prophets to know that you are against their falsehood. And then you are talking as if you are not sure of what you are saying. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob 
their sins. Look at verse 2. If verse 2, yet they seek me daily. They go to church. They go to conventions. They go to assemblies. Go to fellowships. They pray. They fast. They seek the face of the Lord. But there's no foundation. No foundation of righteousness. No foundation of holiness. No foundation of redemption. No foundation of living a life without reproach. A life without sin. It says, cry aloud. They seek me daily. And they delight to know my ways. As a nation that did righteousness. As a nation that did. They don't. But it's like they are pretending uh, as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take the light in approaching to God. But they are not doing what the Lord wants done. And he says, cry aloud. He tells us in Nehemiah, as you look at Nehemiah, we don't have time to read all that. But you know what did Nehemiah did? He interrogated, he investigated about the walls of Jerusalem, about the foundations. And when he did that then he interceded, he prayed. After that, he came, he left the lucrative job he was doing. He was willing to sacrifice if you're going to be a restorer, if you're going to be a reformer. If you're going to be a repairer, you must uh, be willing to leave your comfort zone. I'm comfortable with this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. But you know, you need to come and do something you know, that others are not able to do and repair the foundation. And then he went around when he came to Jerusalem. And then he rode on his horse, he investigated everything. Then he called people and said, See the condition in which we are. And in chapter 3, it began, and this one repaired this, and that one repaired this, and that one repaired that. And then in chapter 4, when they called him, uh, let us go and hide somewhere. It says, you're such a man as I flee. They wanted to employ people, hire people, and make him afraid so they can silence him. And Nehemiah will not be silenced. In chapter 5 of Nehemiah, then all the nobles that were oppressing the people, he called them. He said, you must not continue doing this. He challenged everything that ought to be challenged. And then eventually he got a promise from them that they will not oppress or cheat the people anymore. And then eventually uh, when people said, come and hide somewhere, I, a man like me, should I hide? And eventually he brought out the scriptures and he reached unto them and the people cried and they wept and they repented and they brought back the foundation. In the final chapter, all the people that were not living right and they were compromising, he readjusted everything and he brought back the standard of the worship of God. That's what the Lord is calling you to. And that's what the Lord is still calling me to, that will be repairers. Number three, what must restorers do? What must restorers do? The Lord has called you and the Lord has called me. He wants us to be restorers. He wants us to be reformers. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 8. I was reading from verse 5. Hebrews chapter 8, reading from verse 5, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for see. Says he that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. What will restore us, dear? Go back to the pattern, the pattern shown from heaven, the pattern revealed by God, the pattern emphasized by Christ, the pattern given to us in the epistles by the apostles and the prophets. And Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. The restorers must go back to that and see that you make everything, that you build all things, that you establish all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Uh, do you remember Paul the Apostle? Of course you do. You know, Paul the Apostle, he had prayed to the Galatians, and then when he saw them, he said, I'm surprised. 
I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you unto another gospel. They were shifting the foundation. They were replacing the foundation. And then he told them, you remember in chapter 2, he said, when they came and they wanted to bring us into bondage, he said, no, we didn't give them any chance. No, not for an hour. He emphasized the word of God. In chapter 3, he said, this same foundation is still where we stand. In chapter 3, verse 11, that the just shall live by faith. You see, that's what the Lord is calling us to, so that we don't allow the you know, doors to come over justification by faith and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And we're just preaching other things, uh, good, good things. But then the foundation is no more being emphasized. And he said in chapter 4, I stand in doubt of you. He said, I preach the gospel unto you, but you are going astray now. I'm traveling in birth again for you. And then in chapter 9, he says, don't you understand that the little leaven will live on the whole lump, cleanse all the leaven and come back to where you ought to be. And it says in chapter 6, it says, now we restore all those who are falling. Yes, you restore them in meekness and you restore them with love, but you will restore. You will tell them this is not right and that is not right. And then he says, I'm crucified to the world and the world unto me. All I want to be is to be a new creature and the faith that walks by love. And I want to pass it to everyone too. That is what they did when they had restoration. Let me show you something practical. In second, in a second Chronicles chapter 19, second Chronicles chapter 19, I will read him from verse 4. Second Chronicles chapter 19, reading from verse 4. And Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem, and he went out again through the people from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim, and he brought them back to the Lord God of their fathers. What had happened in an earlier chapter, chapter 18, Jehoshaphat had gone with Ahab, and then he had said, my people are like your people, and that kind of an equal yoke, they went to the battlefield he almost died and when he came back a prophet challenged him should you help should you support should you assist should you encourage that person that is against god who hates god and god hates him and now when he came back he saw what he had done I must be a restorer. I must bring the people back. And he went from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim and he brought the people that he had led astray and the people he had led into backsliding, he brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers. Look at verse 5. He tells us in verse 5, and he said, Judges in the land throughout all the fenced cities of Judah, city, by city. He was now going to look at everything and make sure that all the cities are catered for. And in every city, the foundation will be laid again. The foundation of worship, the foundation of doctrine, the foundation of proper teaching, and the foundation of walking in the way of the Lord, city by city. In verse 6, he tells us in verse 6, and he said to the judges, take heed what ye do, for ye judge not for man, but for the Lord who is with you in the judgment. In verse 7, it says in verse 7, Wherefore now let the fear of the Lord be upon you, and take heed and do it. For there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, no respect of persons. Underline that. No respect of persons. Please underline that and please take note of that. No respect of persons, no the taking of gifts. And there are some, I'm surprised, surprised. There are some preachers, some leaders of churches that talk today as if they are the final authority. As if they can tell God, God, this is what you said in your word, but this is what I'm telling our people. And God, you have to readjust and take to what I am saying it's like they are above the law. They are above the constitution. They are above the Bible. They are above the word of God or the will of God. When somebody gets to that situation where he feels his own proclamation 
or his own idea or his own uh, false doctrine is greater than the word of God, that's very dangerous for that man. There is no respect to persons with God, no taking uh, of gifts. That's why it says in verse 8, in verse 8 it says, moreover, in Jerusalem the Jehoshaphat said of the Levites and of the priests and of the chief of the fathers of Israel, for the judgment of the Lord and for controversies and when, when they returned to Jerusalem. The Lord wants us to return, return to the word, return to the truth. I return to the revelation of the word of God and never allow any atom of compromise in our ministry, in our life, in our service. The Lord help you, help everyone in Jesus. Name. Point number three now, a willingness, a willingness to reinforce and defend the restored foundation. By coming back to um, Psalm 11 and verse 3. It says, if the foundations be destroyed, watch and the righteous do. If the foundations be destroyed, watch can the righteous do. The righteous must be willing to reinforce the foundation and to defend the foundation once it is restored. Now, I want you to look at um, Daniel chapter 11, verse 32. Daniel chapter 11, verse 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. It says, such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. How does a minister? How does a pastor, how does a shepherd, how does a founder, how does an overseer get to destroying the foundation, get to destroying the work of God? When people of the world flatter us, they say they respect us, they say they appreciate us, it's a bitch, it's a bitch. That flattery is to flatter us until we were let down, corrupt the covenant, and corrupt the foundation, and destroy the foundation. And those who have been corrupted like that by flatteries, they too will use flattery and say, we love you, we appreciate you, you're one of the greatest, uh, you know, preachers, and one of the greatest leaders in our state here, in our community, in our local government here, in the nation over here, by flattery, they want, and then you cannot talk against the evil doing anymore and the evil deeds anymore. It is by that flattery they were destroyed, and by that same flattery they want to destroy you. I pray God will help you to remain strong. Are you here, your amen? You remain strong in Jesus' name. You will not be among those that are destroying foundation. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, chapter 6, reading from verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, preachers, brothers, sisters, Pastors, shepherds, overseers, finally, my brethren, finally, restorers, repairers, reformers, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. If you're going to be a repairer, if you're going to be a restorer, you must not be afraid to speak against unrighteousness. You must not be afraid to speak against compromise. You must be strong in your mind. You must be strong in your backbone. You must be strong in your conviction and in the power of his might. In verse 11, it says in verse 11, you put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. If there's any time to stand, these are the times to stand. Look at three things here. Number one, declare the doctrine of full redemption. Declare the doctrine of full redemption. Don't just preach. Don't just preach. In your preaching, do you mention repentance at all? Do you mention faith in Christ at all? Do you mention the new birth at all? 
Do you mention being a new creature in Christ? Do you mention holiness without which no man shall see the Lord? Do you mention the life of the believer becoming a believer in Christ and living uncompromisingly? Do you minister earnestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints? Declare the doctrine of full redemption. Number two, develop the disciples for further reinforcement. You are reinforcing the foundation yourself and then you develop other people, other leaders, other preachers, other teachers that will reinforce the foundation along with you. Develop the disciples for further reinforcement. Number three, demonstrate the devotion of former reformers. Demonstrate the devotion of former reformers. Number one is to declare the doctrine of full redemption in First Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 6. In First Timothy chapter 4, looking at verse 6, it tells us, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. You put the brethren in remembrance. You put the church in remembrance. You put the believers in remembrance. Don't say they know it already. Say it again. Don't say and already they know that. Emphasize that again. Follow peace with all men. Say that again. And holiness without which no man shall say the Lord. Remind your wife about that. Remind your husband about that. Remind your children about that. Remind the workers about that. Remind mind all the members about that declare the doctrine of full redemption look at verse 15 in verse 15 it tells us meditate upon these things everything you are hearing today about the foundation destroyed about the foundation displaced about the foundation ruined, about the foundation corrupted, everything you are hearing about becoming a righteous preacher, becoming a righteous, uncompromising a soldier of the cross, and being a repairer, and being a reformer, and being a restorer, meditate upon these things. All that is happening in our nation, all that is happening in our continent, all that is happening, and the word of God raising you up, raising us up, and saying, this is what to do. Meditate upon these things and give thyself Holy to them. Don't come to the pulpit half-hearted. Don't come to the pulpit shallow. Don't come to the pulpit almost dozing and sleeping. Don't come to the pulpit afraid that you cannot stand and you cannot maintain sound doctrine. Give yourself holy entirely, courageously to them, that thy prophet he may appear to all. In verse 16, it says, Take heed unto thyself. Don't be a compromiser. Take heed unto thyself. Don't be French false prophets. Take heed unto thyself. Don't support false prophets. Take heed unto thyself. Don't support the people that have gone beyond obeying the watch of God. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. And unto the doctrine, the doctrine of full redemption, continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. You cannot do it alone. That's why we come to number two, develop the disciples for further reinforcement. While you are enforcing the foundation, you want to develop other people, you want to raise up other people, engage other people, enlist other people, enable, empower other people, and you want to take them along with you while you are going to the field and you are going to stand and you want to demonstrate to them how they too, how they will stand. You develop other disciples that will further reinforce the foundation of full redemption. Come to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses the same commit thou to faithful men. The same don't change the word. 
Jesus only is our Savior, the same you commit to other people, is our sanctified, the same commit to other people, is our healer, the same commit to other people, is our baptizer in the Holy Ghost, the same commit to other people what you had from Christ. And Christ passed on to the apostles, and the apostles passed on to us the same commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. The same you commit to faithful men who are faithful men, men who have accepted the word, who have believed the word, who are living by the word, who are faithful in their staying, standing by the word of God, who do everything in ministry, who do everything in their families, who do everything you know, that they're given to do in faithfulness. Those are the faithful people. Faithful people are courageous people. Cowards are not faithful. They cannot be faithful. Those who are shifting here and there, and those who are walking by the wind, and they're looking at the faces of people. Can I say this? Can I say that? If I say this, will he be happy? If I say, if they hear that I say that, will they be happy? All those people cannot be faithful. Don't waste your life on unfaithful people. Get faithful people together and and develop these disciples that believe the word of God, that stand on the word of God. And the same thing you have taught them, and the same thing we have taught them, they will commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Look at uh, Exodus chapter 18, uh, Exodus chapter 18, uh, we're reading from verse 19. Exodus chapter 18, uh, we're reading from verse 19 here. It says, Hearken now unto my voice, and I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Look at this. Be thou for the people to God watch. Don't get involved with anything uh, that is not going to get people nearer to God, that is not going to get people nearer to really serving God, believing the word of God, standing for the word of God. Be thou for the people to God word, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, it says, And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shall show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work they must do. The work they must do. Underline the word must as we supervise the work of the, you know, various uh, people who are under our leadership. Let them know what they must do. This is of the ministry. This other one, that one is redundant. That's not what you are called to do. This one, that's not important. That's not what you are called to do. You tell them that the work preachers are to do, the work they must do. You tell them the work teachers, teachers of the word, what they must do, what work assignment they must do. Anyone involved in the work, the work they must do. Look at verse 21. In verse 21, it says, Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, able men, able men. You know, if somebody is going to remain in the ministry, he must be able, he must be capable. It must be a man, a woman of ability, a man, a woman of strength, a man, a woman of backbone, a man, a woman who still has a thinking faculty and he can think, he can analyze, he has the strength, a man who has the ability. Now, my brother, my sister, if I don't have ability, even physical ability or physical strength, or if I cannot read my Bible very well, if I have eyes problem, even with using glasses, if I had problem, and if I was speaking, I had problem. If I am weak physically, I'm not an able-bodied man. And then there are people who are able, instead of me saying, I will step aside and let this able man, able woman, take the place. Young man, you have the fire, you have the fervency, and you have the knowledge, and you have the way without coming and stepping here and do the work. If I don't do that, and I keep the church in bondage, 
I keep the church in ignorance. I know that I'm not able, and yet I'm not giving the chance to the people that are able. That's selfish, that's sinful, that will not be right. I want the work of God to be destroyed at the expense of my just occupying the position. It's saying, moreover, thou shalt provide out of the people able men such as fear God. Men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands. Why don't you underline that in your Bible? Those are of us here, to be rulers of thousands, and then to be rulers of hundreds, and to be rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Here is what counsel Moses had. They were in their millions. And uh, Jethro was saying, you cannot see everybody. You cannot touch everybody. Why don't you have overseers, over thousands, over hundreds, and over fifties, and over tens, and they will rule over them. They will guide them. They will instruct them. They will teach them. That's how to do the work. And make sure that all those people you put as leaders over them, over the districts, over the groups, over the regions, over the states, we're supervising them, and the work of God is being done like it ought to be done. I want you to notice something this is very important. I want you to underline those words, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens, in Exodus chapter 18, verse 21, and come now to First Samuel chapter 8, First Samuel chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 11. First Samuel chapter 8, look at verse 11. Here is God telling the children of Israel, the king is going to come. This king, when he comes, that you say we we'll want a king, set a king over us that will lead us like other nations. Look at what he will do. He says in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 11, and he said, This will be the manner, the character, the principle, the practice of the king that shall reign over you. Look at this. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself. Not for the work of God. He will appoint them for himself, for his chariots, to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots. Look at verse 12. What the king will do. He will appoint captains over thousands. You see that? He will appoint these people for himself. You see, there are preachers, there are pastors, there are overseers. What should be done, organized, arranged for the work of God, that the people will be faithful unto God. And you appoint what rulers over thousands, over hundreds, over fifties, and over tens for the progress of the work of God it's not for them. It's not for them. He will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties and send them to hear his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of chariot. You see what he will do? Look at verse 13. In verse 13, and he will take your daughters to be confessionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. Instead of allowing them to serve God, all he wants to do now is to serve him. Do you know what Saul did? Saul had 3,000 soldiers. What are they doing? Were they fighting in the battle of the Lord? No, no. They were helping him to chase after David, his enemy. All he wanted to do now, everything became personal. And that's what the Lord is telling us, we should not do. And once you see anybody like that, that all he wants is his own advantage, is not thinking of the progress of the work of God, you do that for me and you take care of my the open shop and the open farms, and the open this, and, and it's all personal, personal business. And instead of training people, instead of developing people that will take care of the work of God, like Moses did, 
like David did, and like Paul the Apostle did, and the rest of people that will emphasize the word of God, and they will stay on the foundation. They now start raising up those people for themselves. I pray the Lord will help you. The Lord will help us that every one of us will come back and will demonstrate, number three now demonstrate, the devotion of former reformers. If I could tell you, I remind you of a person like Martin Luther, Martin Luther, how he was a reformer. And as a reformer, you know, the Catholic Church was in charge of everything. And all their dogmas was everything that they had. But Martin Luther rose up as a reformer. That's how we now have the Protestant Church in all the various denominations. And although those, some of those Protestant churches are also going back, they're going back to the Catholic Church and they're going back to all the, all the various things and the error of those people because they have laid the foundation the Lord is saying, now you must have, and I must have, and we must have the devotion of the former reformers. Remember John Wesley, how he stood with the word of God, and he went up and down, and he established holiness once again, and he established sanctification once again. You remember a person like Charles G. Finney, how those people rose up, and then they emphasized once again the salvation, the sanctification, the Holy Ghost baptism. Our time has now come that God will help Help you and God will help me, and we will emphasize the truth of the word of God. That's what God has called us to. He says in Jude chapter 1, verse 3. Jude chapter 1, verse 3. I know you know it, but let's uh, see it again in Jude chapter 1, verse 3. It says, When beloved, when I give all diligence, all diligence, all diligence, the work we're doing for the Lord, give all your heart, give all your strength, give all your ability the last breath and the last strength, the last drop of blood that remains in you. Give everything. Don't say, I'm, you know, trying to keep myself. I'm watching this. I'm watching this. No. All diligence. If you cannot give all diligence, maybe you are not an able man. Maybe you are not an able woman. Maybe you need to step aside and give the chance to younger people and give the chance to visionary people and give the chance to reformers that will be able to stand up and they can give all diligence it says, Beloved, when I give all diligence, all right, unto you of the common salvation, salvation available for everyone, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should, that you must earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For the faith which was once delivered unto the saints, everything the Lord has delivered unto us. In short, the whole Bible, the whole Word of God that leads people to reconciliation with God, that leads people to conversion by the grace and the power of God, that leads people to righteous living, holy living, the sanctification, the power in the Holy Ghost, everything the Lord has given to us, not allowing a judge, a title to fall to the ground. He says that we, you and I, and the people we're raising up, shall honestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The Lord is calling us to a great assignment today, and a renewed assignment today. Because the foundation is being eroded and the foundation is being destroyed. The foundation is being ruined. And the Lord is calling you as a righteous man, a righteous woman. The Lord is calling you as a reformer, as a repairer, as a restorer. And the Lord is calling you to come with strength and energy and with devotion and consecration and commitment and say, Lord, I cannot pretend I don't see, I see the land, I see what is going on. And I cannot pretend that, you know, many of us are now cold and we're, you know, kind of uh, taking the back seat. It's like, you know, where as we're getting older, we're getting cooler and we don't have that forcefulness anymore. We don't have that power, that commitment anymore. I cannot pretend, I don't know. You tell the Lord, oh Lord, now I come back and I'm going to be a restorer. 
I'm going to be a repairer. I'm going to be a reformer. Why don't you please stand up and say, Lord, here I come. Lord, here I come. I'm going to do the work of the Lord. The Lord has called upon us today. Please stand up, my brother. Please stand up, my sister. Here is a serious thing in the land. Here is a serious thing in the kingdom of God. The Lord wants us to re-examine the foundation again. Start from your personal life. Is the foundation still there? Foundation of righteousness is it still there. The foundation of faith is it still there. And the foundation of consecration is it still there. Start from your own life and start from your own uh, ministry and from your own local church and start from your own region and start from your own state and start from your own nation where you are ministering. Is the foundation of faith still there? Is the foundation of faithfulness still there? Are we still faithful? Is the foundation of devotedness still there? The foundation of uh, devotion, consecration is still still there. And the foundation of fearlessness, fearlessly declaring the word of truth as God has given unto us. And the foundation of truthfulness that we're truthful, that we're not uh, cutting corners, that we're not compromising, that we're not covering evil, that we're not covering falsehood, that we're not going along with you. are not one of the people that are taking things from the YouTube and from the internet, all those false things, and they say, pass this on to other people, pass this on to other people, and you are passing on error, a deeper life preacher, a deeper life teacher, a deeper life leader. What are you doing? Are you part of the people destroying the foundation of the work of God? Come back and say, Lord, now I'm going to stand and I'm going to stand on your word. I'm going to stand on the truth. Let us together restore the foundation of truth and the foundation of redemptive doctrine. Let us return back to where we started so that, Lord, they receive why the Lord called us and why the Lord established deeper life Bible church or deeper Christian life ministry, that same reason we will still forge ahead and do it today. The foundation of evangelism, personal evangelism, mass evangelism, all way evangelism, everywhere, every method, every technique of evangelism, that God will give us a renewed vision, a renewed strength, a renewed focus. And then we will say, Lord, we're back on our feet again. And the revival of uh, holiness, the revival of sanctification, and the revival of taking our stand like Daniel purposed in his heart, he would not defile himself with any sin of Babylon. That you take your stand as well like that, and that you will say, Oh Lord, I'm going to stand and not waver, I'll not shake, I'll not compromise, I'll not support any false prophet. I'll not support anyone that is uh, just uh, going on and not religion without righteousness, religion without foundation. I'm not going to support anything like that. Tell the Lord that the Lord will give you the grace you had in days gone by, the strength you had in days gone by. And the forcefulness, the faithfulness you had in days gone by, the courage you had in days gone by, that Lord, the Lord will give you that same courage again. And you will become, by the grace of God, in the strength of God, with all the armor of God upon your life, that you will become once again a repairer of the foundations that are broken down, a restorer of the standard that have been broken down, a reformer of the truth of God, that God will help you. You'll be a reformer, you'll be a restorer, and the devotion of those former revivalists, the Lord will grant unto you. Let him walk on your heart from the inner man and walk on your conviction and walk on your spirit and walk in your backbone that from now on, by the grace of God, you will stand. You'll not smile when you're to frown. You'll not laugh when you're to weep. You'll not go along with uh, people who are eroding, destroying the foundation of the work of God. You'll not be unequally yoked together with those who are destroying the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and are putting Calvary and the suffering 
You are bringing that to the mold. You raise up the cross again. Raise up Calvary again. And raise up what Christ has done again. So that with one voice, one hand, one purpose, one pursuit, we in deeper life will rise up, reach forth, reestablish the foundation of the Christian faith that is breaking down in our country, in our continent, even beyond our continent. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for what you have reminded us of, that the foundation is being destroyed. Foundation of the temple, foundation of worship, foundation of godliness, foundation of justification by faith, foundation of Christian living, holy living, foundation of sanctification, foundation of sound doctrine, being eroded, being destroyed. And you have reminded us, we have prayed before you, we have repented before you, we have looked up unto you, and we have committed, consecrated ourselves before you. Lord, we pray the grace and the strength to stand by what we have opened our mouth to say before you tonight, grant unto us in Jesus' name. Take every weakness out of us. Take unfaithfulness out of us. And take fear with all the consequences of fear and with all the uh, paraphernalia of fear. Take everything away from us in Jesus' name. With boldness, with courage, with fortitude, with faith, with vision, grant us the power, the authority, grant us the anointing to forge on and to move ahead and to defend the truth, even with our blood in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to rise up like militant righteous people, militant reformers, militant restorers, militant repairers, so that the foundation of the redemptive truth will be raised up again and re-established again in our nation, in our country, in Jesus' name, in our continent, in Jesus' name, and anywhere you grant us opportunity and influence in Jesus' name. I will pray that that spirit of compromise will wipe away from our lives and wipe away from everyone who are members and ministers of the church, of this church, in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. We we'll pray immediately now. We we'll begin to walk on this. We we'll begin to see when we investigate and examine and reestablish and reaffirm all that you want us to reaffirm. I pray, Lord, your grace will continue with us. And Lord, we pray, until we leave this world and until Christ will come, we'll not stop doing the work you have given us to do and doing it in the way you want it done. With courage and boldness, never looking back. Let your fire remain in every one of us. We we'll thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.